there, boy. I can see her. She needs us. She has arrived at an unknown shore. covered in Christmas come, aren't I? Okay, well, that can only mean one thing. It's time to talk about uh, some Jess Franco titles, and it looks like we have all titles from Severin, which, uh, Severin, you really, you, you, you can't stay mad at them no matter what they do. Come Christmas time, you look at your shelf and you see all the that sweet <laughs> delicious Jess Franco-ness that they have provided us, and it's it's like a it, it, it's it's like a hall pass. They have an eternal hall pass because of all this oh this sweet oh rub on my titties Jess Franco oh goodness oh uh. Uh, so let's talk about these four uh, Severin. Jess Franco releases, all of which uh, have been chosen because uh, they include a very interesting special feature, which we'll get into momentarily. So let's dig in to these movies. Jess Franco films are, for the most part, more about experiments in tone and narrative and fucking. In a way, it's fascinating to see what amounts to an experimental, borderline avant-garde filmmaker explore mostly B-movie concepts. And yet, here we are. So first up, let's take care of... Let's start with this one. Cries of Pleasure. Placer salvaje. One of Jess Franco's many great qualities is he, he could make a film while all, while using the resources provided to him by the producer's money used to cover the film that the producers actually financed. Uh, basically, he was a he was a cheat, uh, but a great cheat, a great artistic cheat. Cries of Pleasure is just one of those many many films, uh, and among his erotic efforts, it ranks as one of the best. Now, best does come with a bit of a. Um, this is, as I said, an erotic effort, and so it is mostly just fucking. Well, fake fucking, and that is extremely obvious most of the time, but that's kind of part of the charm. These scenes take up a lot of time, often utilizing just one shot with plenty of zooms. The zooms in this are nuts. As Stephen Thrower notes multiple times, this has a very elasticating effect. The scenes are provocative, hypnotic, sometimes even disturbing. The plot is aggressively simple. A man's old lover comes to stay at his villa where he lives with his adopted daughter slash lover. Él me violó cuando yo tenía 12 años. Gross. His wife is set to return this same day from her stay at a mental asylum. Dude goes about fucking all three of them and sets about a murder plot that goes, let's just say, not according to plan. The video quality here is absolutely wonderful, stunning. There are a few age-related defects here and there, but nothing aggressive. It's a 4K master scanned from the original 35mm negative, and it looks it. It is a solid-looking flick. Extras-wise, we get In the Land of Franco Part 1, which is a 21-minute look at various filming locations from Franco Flicks, hosted by the one and only Stephen Thrower. Notably, Thrower makes a good case for Franco being an absolute mastermind when it comes to making the most of his locations. Also, I now desperately want to watch The Erotic Rites of Frankenstein. He makes a good case for that one. These location tours cover Portugal and Spain, hence the Land of Franco part of the title. When Donald Met Jess and Lena, part one, is an 11-minute archival interview conducted by the one and only Donald Farmer in 1993 with Franco and Romay. Among other things, they talk about Lena's uh, disinterest in fame and Jess's shooting and editing methods. 
Jess Franco's Golden Years is a 26-minute documentary, which, just FYI, was cropped when I ripped it for the episode, but looks just fine when it's played. Uh, I'm just lazy and, and didn't fix it. Anyway, basically, it's Stephen Thrower explaining Jess Franco's work with Golden Films International with an emphasis on Cries of Pleasure, making it the only extra specifically about the film. Next up, Night of Open Sex. Uh, this is one of six films directed by Jess Franco in 1981. Another Golden Films venture, Night of Open Sex, is a delightfully absurd little tale of, well, sex, uh, borderline espionage, crime tropes, and uh, Nazi gold, baby. It's also sort of an Edgar Allan Poe adaptation, loosely, uh, but the connection to the gold bug is technically there, if you, if you dig. Uh, unlike Cries of Pleasure, this film is all over the place. Uh, <laughs> where that one is very restrictive it's lo in its locations and keeps the action contained, Nine of Open Sex is a bit of a sprawling adventure. At least that's how Jess Franco manages to make it feel. It's also tonally insane. There are silly, downright comedic sex scenes, globetrotting, treasure hunting, wanton, murder, rape, and one of the most horrific torture scenes of Franco's career that I am definitely not showing on YouTube. At one point, Lena Romay just kind of makes out with dirty magazines and rubs herself while Jess zooms in and out for what seems like 10 straight minutes as an audience watches on. It is magical. Now, while she's doing this, the crowd is absolutely enraptured by her free-spirited displays of sexuality. She's incredible, and while it's totally absurd that this woman writhing on the floor with fuck mags would create such a reaction, the way Franco shoots it, you, you kind of believe it. There's a scene where Lena Romay is kidnapped and tied to a bed, and her kidnapper sticks a peach in her mouth and proceeds to rape her while continuing to eat the peach. Also, it's Antonio Mayans, and so he, he kind of gets away with it. Of course, it wouldn't be Franco without some um, issues. Uh, at one point, Lena is meant to be sucking this dude's cock, and the idea, production-wise, is that her hair will cover the fact that no such thing is happening. Unfortunately, Franco chooses the worst possible angle, and Lena gets a bit too wild in her movements, resulting in a very humorous image that I, I still don't think I can show you on the tubes, just gonna be honest with you there. Uh, you, you know what, fuck it, uh, just go buy Night of Open Sex. It's <laughs> it's probably the worst of this stack, but it's pretty gosh darn entertaining, so long as you're okay with lots of naked Lena Romay writhing around, which, I mean, if you don't, then you, you're probably not a, a big Franco fan. Uh, extras wise, we get uh, In the Land of Franco Part 2, which is the 15 minute continuation of Stephen Thrower's tour of Franco locations. Uh, again, it's highly informative, and beyond that, makes me really want to travel the world and visit these places myself. When Donald Met Jess and Lena Part 2 is a nine minute continuation of, well, Part 1. Uh, notably, Jess talks about his budgets, which, as a cheap bastard myself, is, uh, is much appreciated. Uh, the Night of Open Jess is a humorously titled 20-minute look at Franco's career in the early 80s with a focus on Night of Open Sex. Again, we have Stephen Thrower on education duty, and as usual, his voice is total ear sex. F fuck, fuck, me in my, fuck, fuck me in my fucking side head, man. Oh, you British piece of... Oh. Next up, Shining Sex. Uh, in 1976, Franco made 10 films, one of them being Midnight Party for Eurocine, with... God, Uh, with the money and locations of that film, he also made Shining Sex, a film that is extremely different from Midnight Party. Uh, that film was basically a sex comedy slash spy film, while Shining Sex is the tale of uh, mind control fuck litter and interdimensional aliens. So, yeah, a little different. As far as the print goes, this sucker is pretty legit overall. Green or yellow tint kind of fades in and out. Uh, there's plenty of damage, but nothing especially distracting. Often it's just dirty, which is to be expected for a release with as much history of poor transfers as this one. Considering those releases, near constant color shifting seems pretty trivial. Uh, like the other films in this stack, the source was the original negative, so what we're looking at is probably the best we're ever going to get, and it's more than enough in, in my opinion. It looks kind of beautiful, in fact, uh, especially with all that sweet, sweet on-location photography. Mm. 
Anyway, back to the film. Uh, I hope you like staring at vaginas, because there is so much nudity in this movie that it's hard to find clips for this review. It's basically all Lena Romay running around either dancing naked, fucking naked, or fuck killing naked. In between that, she wears some truly remarkable outfits, walks around some beautiful French scenery, and... Oh, there's her vagina again. Great. This dude, uh, played by Romay's husband at the time, Raymond Hardy, is always wearing shades, even though he's just lounging with his cock out. Uh, honestly, that's the life, though. Like, really. Um, much respect, man. He's really fun to watch, if only because of his look. Regarding the plot, there's literally just a prolonged shot of Evelyn Scott rubbing oil on Lena Romay's vagina, uh, and that lotion compels Romay to do this evil couple's bidding, and one of them is a transdimensional alien. You know, that, that old chestnut. Anyway, back to the nudity. This film is a bit too hardcore for softcore and a bit too softcore for hardcore. I feel like that probably limits its audience quite a bit in our current climate. Uh, it's also just a little bit over long, not dramatically so, but it's not quite as hypnotic in its long drawn out scenes as Christ's pleasure. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's no cinematic masterpiece, but I do think it's pretty spellbinding if you enjoy Franco. And when it does get a little long in the tooth, it breaks out some sex glitter or a bizarre plot beat to reel you back in, uh, if you understand what the fuck is going on. So, you know, pretty strong recommend overall. Uh, extras wise, uh, first up, this is the only release of the bunch with an actual audio commentary, so already this is easily the best extras wise. Uh, although, even without the commentary, that would probably be the case. Said commentary is with author and authors and podcasters uh, Robert Monell and Rod Barrett. Uh, Barrett hosts Nashy Cast, while Monell uh, maintains a Jess Franco centric blog called I'm in a Jess Franco State of Mind, which I do plan on diving into, much like this commentary, uh, which I only listened to for about 10 minutes. As usual, this was just a time constraint because uh, I suck. Uh, what I listened to was not a mind-blowing commentary, but certainly a very knowledgeable discussion uh, that doesn't sound scripted or anything. It's just like these two nerds who really love Jess Franco. Um, so uh, pretty fun stuff, you know, just... Two nerds trying to explain the madness in front of them, and I, I can dig that and 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 relate. Uh, in the Land of Franco Part Three continues our Euro trip with 12 more minutes of Stephen Thrower, uh, this time joined by frequent Franco collaborator Antonio Mans. Oddly enough, accompanying the only movie in the stack that he's not actually in. Uh, early on, he explains how Franco shot an entire film because he really liked a specific lens filter, which just is so relatable. Uh, we also see where Uncle Jess's ashes were spread and how the remaining ashes are um, <laughs> kept fed. Uh, this one was weirdly heartwarming. Shining Jess is another thrower interview. This one focused on Shining Sex and Franco's early 70s career. At 19 minutes, it's a lovely dissection from the world's uh, for foremost Franco. Foremost Francophile. Perhaps best of all, if you were left confused by Shining Sex, Thrower does a great job breaking it down and simplifying the rather uh, cloudy plot. Uh, Never Met Franco is a six minute interview with Gerard, uh, I'm gonna say Coin, I, I'm sure he said his name, but I don't remember. Anyway, uh, he was a sound mixer. He worked on dubbing Franco's films and he explains the unique challenges therein. Then there's filmmaker Christopher Gans, uh, who gives a great 29-minute interview entitled Francophilia, uh, which does a phenomenal job of explaining the appeal of Franco and, you know, what it sort of is like to be a part of his fan base. Uh, Franco at Eurocine is a 17-minute interview with Daniel Lesur, whose father uh, distributed many Jess Franco films. He also worked with Jess back in the day, so he has uh, quite a few first-hand stories from those days, including the initial romance between Jess and Lena. Um, there's also the discussion of Eurocine's um, not amazing attempts to make zombie movies with Jess. Uh, let's see here. Uh, and then, oh, and then we get 13 minutes of hardcore outtakes. Uh, literally just hardcore inserts. 13 minutes of dick and vagina. Uh, so if you didn't get enough vagina the first go around, there's more. I'm starting to, I'm starting to think I'm not going to get ad revenue for this video. Merry Christmas. Um, finally, Bahia Blanca. Uh, we get some, some sweet, 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 sweet goodness here. Uh, 1984's Bahia Blanca, 
uh, a film many Franco enthusiasts worried might never see a proper high-end release, forever relegated to the astonishingly awful VHS that circulated for years. Uh, but here we are, and I'd even go so far as to say that this is one of the best releases of the year, if only for its historical value to Francophiles. Unfortunately, it was also a sale exclusive, and so it's no longer available through Severin. Although if you go to eBay, you can still grab it for between 40 and 60 bucks. Uh, not the greatest deal in the world, but if you find yourself enamored by his other works, certainly worth it. Um, you know, if you ever looked up like the Golden Goya collection, it's it's a fucking pain. It's, 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 a, and it's an expensive hobby to love Franco. Now that said, if you're looking for lots of vag close-ups and extreme violence, I suggest you slow your roll. While Bahia Blanca does feature quite a bit of Franco's trademarks, it also contains more melodrama than anything else. Dreamy, strange, sleazy melodrama, but melodrama nonetheless, it feels kind of like a soap opera. Uh, Plot-wise, I think Severin sums it up nicely on the back of the case. Um, let's see. When a battered corpse washes ashore in a small Spanish fishing village, the local community of prostitutes, mobsters, and lawmen will begin to seethe with lust, vengeance, and murder. Yeah. God damn it. Now, all of these elements are present with strong focus on the prostitute and her younger mute sister, played by Lena Romay, who live on an island across the bay from the fishing village. At least, I think that's how the geography works. There's also these two young lovers, the sheriff played by Antonio Manns, and this douchebag who you might remember from Night of Open Sex. There's a beautiful acoustic guitar score that pervades the whole of the film, which uh, maintains a kind of a typically hypnotic tone throughout. It's a shame that this is one of those films that never got theatrical release and languished in the land of garbage quality VHS for so long because it's truly one of the most accomplished efforts that I've seen so far in my Franco journey. Just top marks, cannot recommend it enough. Extras wise, uh, we get In the Land of Franco part four, which brings us the end for now of Stephen Thrower's tour through Spain. Uh, this one is 17 minutes long, and in addition to the exploration side of things, it also features Mayans discussing the death of Lena Romay and Jess's last days, and it's it's a lot. Uh, if, if part three is heartwarming, part four is heartbreaking. Um, interestingly, the segment ends with a to-be-continued tag, meaning presumably we'll be seeing more from the series. Uh, hopefully more was shot before COVID struck. Um, there might actually be a news item about this. I don't know. Uh, Bay of Jess, meanwhile, is Stephen Thrower talking pretty thoroughly about the film, including more about Jess working with Golden Films and Jess's own company, Mancoa, for a hair under 19 minutes. And that's it. That's all we get here. I wish there was a commentary or something more here just because of how big this release is and how great it is as a film. Um, but still, solid release. So how would I rank these movies? That's tough. Um, as physical releases, they're pretty much all on par with one another, unless a Severin slip somehow changes your, mi your mind, uh, in which case, it's I guess it goes to Shining Sex, which does have the most extras and is certainly the most uh, what the fuck of the films. However, for me, the two best films of the bunch have to be Cries of Pleasure and Bahia Blanca, with the latter perhaps offering the strongest overall film including some really solid iconography that'll definitely stick in your brain for a long, long time. And you know, yeah, I, I can't really recommend any of these too much highly over the others. Again, I think Shining Sex is the best overall package, but these are just great releases of great Jess Franco films. I would actually say, as long as you're okay with a lot of the um, fuckings that go on, which I mean, honestly, uh, it's Franco, that's part of his appeal. Uh, this is a great kind of like starter kit, I would think, uh, for Jess Franco. They're not necessarily like the best films to start with, but you know, minus Bahia Blanca, they're pretty cheap. Uh, they have decent extras, they have great transfers. Uh, there are definitely better Jess Franco movies, but I know Cries of Pleasure ranks pretty highly among a lot of uh, his fans. Uh, I didn't like it as much as they did, but I still had a really, really good time with it. So it's definitely not a dislike by any means, but you know, it's, it's one of those films that I think is really fucking solid and will probably rank pretty highly uh, once I 
I finish my giant like 180 film uh, Jess Franco ranking list, um, aka my life's work. Um, yeah, uh, and then Shining Sex and Bahia Blanca are also pretty notable films. I think Night of Open Sex is probably the least favorite of most people, but it's still totally worthwhile. I think a lot of the problems that I've seen people have with it are just that it is very reminiscent of other better Franco films, which uh, is good news. That means there's a lot of great shit out there that I have not watched yet that's going to be amazing. Uh, so yeah, this is a phenomenal stack from Severin Films. Highly, 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 highly recommend all of them. And I am so excited to watch more Franco in the future. Hopefully with less Christmas cum on my head. So, how was that? Franco for Christmas ain't a bad time, huh? His films are strange, challenging, and full of fucking. Not unlike Christmas itself. Tell you what, if this channel makes it to, let's be arbitrary, uh, 10,000 subscribers next year, uh, let's say before November, uh, let's just make all of December Franco month. Uh, every December, every one of them. That's easily like 30 years worth of Christmas specials right there. Uh, don't worry though, I will not relegate just December for Jess Franco. 2021 will still be filled with Franco's work. This, this is just the beginning. What have I done? <sighs> Go watch a movie. Oh, and Merry Christmas.